Hello, I'm Matthew Gavidia. Today in the MGH Labs Medical Medical World News, the American Journal of Managed Care is pleased to welcome Dennis Scanlon, Distinguished Professor of Health Policy and Administration at Penn State University. Can you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work? Sure, Matthew, uh, happy to. Uh, so Dennis Scanlon, uh, I'm a faculty member at Penn State University. My background and training is in public health and economics. I've been at Penn State for 24 years. Uh, I teach in areas of health economics and health policy research design. I direct a research center um, uh, engaged in a variety of different uh, topics related to health services research and health policy, uh, working in interdisciplinary areas, and um, also have uh, some administrative responsibilities. Um, as it pertains to today's topic, I was asked to be one of several individuals at the institution given my background to help advise on uh, what we should do at Penn State, uh, given uh, the COVID pandemic in terms of thinking about um, returning to residential instruction and education uh, for the, the fall of 2020. As schools nationwide decide whether to implement virtual, in-person, or hybrid class strategies amid the COVID-19 pandemic, can you speak on public health concerns voiced by either students or faculty in upper-level uh, academics? Sure. Um, you know, so it's it, it's been an interesting uh, evolution, I, I think, as everybody knows, in, in terms of uh, in this country when, you know, we, we first became significantly aware of the pandemic to the point where it started to change our, our uh, behaviors and our organizational um, or individual behaviors, you know, throughout the summer and, and leading up to the fall. Um, I, I guess what I would say is uh, Higher ed institutions, colleges and universities responded very quickly in, in late February, beginning of March. Um, in many respects, the timing of that response um, was very much conducive with the normal academic schedule of having a spring break. So in fact, at Penn State University, for example, um, you know, we, we had a fairly well timed in the beginning of March, you know, week long ends up if you count both weekends being almost 10 days break. And what that allowed us to do as an institution uh, leading up to that, you know, was sort of understand the issue, try to learn more about the issue and decide what our response should be. And when we opted not to bring uh, students back to residential instruction, but to pivot very quickly and, and operate uh, remotely. Just about every institution across the country did something similar. And I would say it was fortunate to have that timing. As we kind of uh, evolved through the next several months and in, in we're in late spring thinking about the summer and the fall, institutions were faced with the decision of, you know, what to do. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I would say there were, you know, the, the concerns um, that faculty and students have, and I would, I would also put community stakeholders, um, individuals in the communities where uh, our, our institutions are located, we're all, you know, sort of the, the typical ones that people have, uh, health and safety of populations, specifically concerns about mortality, the worst possible outcome, and concerns about uh, those um, uh, who become severely sick, exhausting uh, inpatient healthcare resources in particular. But beyond that, concerns about morbidity, just general sickness in the population and, and what that sickness might do, as well as the infectiousness of the sickness and the ability to transmit and, and spread this to others. So really, I, I think the significant concern was just health and well-being in transmission um, on something that was uh, hard to understand what the uh, variation would be or the probabilities for significant or severe outcomes would be for those getting sick and how that might vary across types of individuals. Um, and, and then also, uh, you know, really decisions around whether to take a more or less conservative approach. At the backdrop um, were you know, concerns about if, if we modify kind of business as usual, so to speak, what are the implications of that? So you know, for communities with colleges and universities, there are economic implications. You know, restaurants, hotels, other businesses that rely on, <clears throat> um, on the, uh, the commerce created by those uh, students and, and faculty and staff and others uh, at those institutions. Um, you know, certainly concerns about uh, how we would modify educational delivery um, to be done in a meaningful way, in a way that was acceptable, uh, and that would achieve kind of the similar types of outcomes that is uh, institutions of higher ed we, we try to achieve. And then also, you know, sort of the, the general preferences of, you know, 
oftentimes at the undergraduate level, uh, you know, certainly 18 to 20 year olds who there's a very social component uh, of college life. There's a participation in extracurricular activities, anything from varsity sports uh, to uh, theater, to music, you know, to other uh, cultural or, or group events. And so really a, a feeling of uh, loss or disappointment if, if we had to kind of give that up, um, especially after a period of time, an extended period of time where people were, you know, locked down essentially um, uh, in, in place. So. Lots of concerns and, and lots of uh, things to balance uh, as these institutions of higher education had to decide uh, how to go forward. And you kind of just addressed this, but in assessing mm -hmm. aspects of reopening plans, what factors warrant consideration and which do you think are still unmet? Yeah, so, you know, I, I know in some of the work that I've done, we, we tried to sort of advise, you know, along the lines of um, thinking about, again, mortality, morbidity, disruption to operations, um, and, and then uh, reputational impact, and, and started to think about, um, as one thinks about sort of reopening, um, you know, you, you can get into a, a myriad of specific issues, but, but how would they affect those? So again, mortality being the worst possible outcome, right? Uh, not wanting to uh, certainly contribute to, to death, uh, if at all possible, to, to control. And, and so thinking about, you know, what do we know uh, about the underlying epidemiology of the disease? What do we know about risk factors? Um, and, and what is the likelihood? You know, what do we know about treatment, which has continued to emerge in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, pharmaceutical therapy or, or non-pharmaceutical uh, in, intervention? So um, thinking about that, uh, you know, the, the more likely uh, scenario, of course, is morbidity and really trying to get a handle on you know, what does morbidity look like? How severe and serious is it? What are the treatment needs? So, you know, making sure that um, if, if you're going to uh, potentially um, increase the risk uh, in a population of disease spread, you know, which certainly would happen from going from everybody staying kind of sheltered in place to opening up to some degree, as you increase that risk, you certainly have to have adequate resources available uh, both resources available to to hopefully prevent, you know, that's PPE, that's uh, sanitation supplies and face masks and things of that nature. Um, but then also um, student health services on campuses, you know, do, do they have the capacity, uh, what is their capacity to see patients that present with, you know, symptoms that might be COVID-like um, to treat, you know, are they up to speed in kind of the, the latest in terms of uh, uh, the ability to diagnose and, and, and make treatment decisions. And, and that gets into the, the whole discussion of testing. Um, what resources does one need for, for testing? You know, I think a lot of institutions thought about this as a testing for symptomatic patients, patients presenting, students presenting, others presenting, you know, with, with, cons with, with symptoms or, or a belief that they may have been exposed. But then also other kinds of testing, which we might call population surveillance testing, which is um, you know, trying to identify asymptomatic individuals because we know specific to COVID-19 uh, that there is a asymptomatic presentation. And, and uh, because of that asymptomatic presentation, um, uh, individuals can, you know, sort of uh, transmit this without ever knowing that they even had it. And that's the really difficult part and, and difficult uh, when one compares uh, COVID-19 to, to other infectious diseases that we've seen on our college campuses uh, in the past. So, uh, you know, beyond that, um, I, I think, you know, they're, they're, they're clearly, I think, across institutions has to be a weighing of, of both sides of this. Um, you know, the, 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 no matter how you slice it, there's uncertainty. Um, and there are cost and benefit trade-offs. Um, and that sounds, um, uh, you know, perhaps to some uh, you know, a little bit crass, but but really trying to weigh the the risk. What level of risk may be worth um, taking, and what are the costs to mitigate that risk? Again, putting all the various things in place, um, and in weighing that against, it, as we talked about earlier, some of the concerns of of others around you know job loss or economic um, impact to the community, tax revenue to the community, things of of, of that nature. So. Uh, as you get into it, then just lots of very specific logistics decisions unique to higher education, such as um, how do we modify class schedules? Uh, how do we um, deal with uh, social distancing in a classroom? So 
we're going to have in person classes, but now the class capacity in a physical space has been cut, you know, from 50 seats to 20 seats or something like that. Uh, you know, so a lot of logistics that I think are very unique to higher education and given the mobility of students um, and, and uh, class offerings. And, and really, when one looks at the period of time, I mean, it was, you know, no more than about probably four months to put these plans in place for those who ultimately decided. How have colleges and universities sought to prioritize safety while also optimizing education as well? Yeah, I mean, I think you could answer that at, at, at uh, a couple different levels. And, you know, one of the things I've done from day one is really tried to sort of understand how others were approaching this. And it was very interesting because I think you, um, uh, I, you know, I observed some institutions that uh, came out of the gate very quickly and said, you know, we can do this, we will do this, we will be open. Others that came out of the gate and said, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we won't do this. Um, you know, it's just, there's too much uncertainty. And so those were, you might argue, first mover institutions on either side. There were a lot of institutions uh, like my own that said, you know, we're not sure, we need to study this, we need to, you know, think about, you know, let, let's, let's see how things emerge through the early part of the summer. We have a little bit of time before we have to make a definitive decision. Let's also sort of learn best practice uh, from medical professionals, from public health professionals. Let's hope that we get guidance from our states. I think, uh, you know, in this period of time, you know, people are also hoping and waiting for uh, more resources and, and at least information around testing and testing capacity. And quite frankly, more guidance from federal officials and, and state level officials as well. And so I, I, I you know, as, as a public health scientist, I would have to emphasize that um, I think a great disappointment from my perspective is is you know sort of um, the lack of speed of having more um, you know more guidance quite frankly from federal and state level health officials uh, uh, about what to be done and, and, and more specific guidance you know quite frankly uh, you know any recommendation comes with a level of uncertainty um, but as no one will be surprised by I mean this pandemic in many respects has been politicized and, and that has trickled down to advice coming from public health officials or not coming, you know, to, to various institutions. So, you know, I, I, I think as the base level was, you know, what, what is an institution's preference for making a decision early or waiting and, and going forward? Um, for those institutions that decided that they wanted to go forward, then uh, you know, prioritizing safety was really a function of how do you prevent um, outbreaks on campus, you know, to begin with? How do we uh, enforce policies around wearing masks, social distancing? Um, how do we, you know, make modifications to gathering spaces like athletic facilities or recreation facilities or dining halls and things of that nature um, as a way to, to prevent and, and kind of mitigate? Um, how do we communicate those policies? Uh, how do we put them in place and have uh, appropriate resources and get those through the supply chain so they were delivered in time, uh, you know, to, to be available at least, you know, by mid-August. Um, you know, then, then there's really communicating around behavioral expectations, and this has been very interesting to follow. Um, you know, as we've seen reopening, you know, timed with uh, rates of transmission and spread uh, in the United States, you know, that really did not decline through the summer, um, you know, starting in late May, um, June, and through July, we, we saw uh, early August significant spikes. So, you know, I think there was hope that uh, rates would, um, would mitigate and, and decline, but in fact, that was the, you know, exact opposite and, and certainly tremendous variation, you know, by state. So there, you know, became questions of, uh, you know, can we get a handle on, you know, whether students would be coming back to our campuses from other locations, um, positively infected and potentially seed, you know, sort of more infections. So a lot of focus on things like entry level testing, which many institutions did, where, uh, you know, students were sent to test kit at their home or asked to quarantine and isolate for uh, seven to 14 days prior to coming to campus in an attempt to, to not bring risk, you know, back to campus, for example. Um, and then, uh, um, you, you know, so I, I guess I'd suffice it to say just a, a whole lot of logistics. I mean, if, if I don't think there's ever probably been a operational or managerial challenge, just writ large, let alone a health challenge uh, that 
institutions of higher education have had, um, like the, the COVID-19 um, response to, to try to open up uh, within such a short period of time. I mean, it really, I think at most places has been all hands on deck. People have given up sort of their day jobs or a significant portion of their day jobs to help out. And, um, and uh, everybody's been trying to learn, you know, in an uncertain environment where uh, oftentimes the recommendations or suggestions can be conflicting. So very challenging uh, indeed.